When I came to you with those calculations, we thought we might start a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. Mm, I remember it well. What happened? I believe we did. Mr. Bean has launched the first nook. I repeat, Mr. Bean has launched the first nook. Uh -oh. Why did he go uh oh for? No reason. <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> New York is gone. You just hit Detroit. Well, I just improved it. <laughs> Can't have shit in Detroit. You literally took it to ash. You launched the first shot. Yeah, but it was funny. Nuclear war. Probably the scariest possibility that can happen to us in this day. To have the capability to see more human death in one day than most of human history. Gone. In a bright, warm flash. The possibility only became a reality less than a hundred years ago by this video. And in that time, we've come close more times than I'd like, in more than one occasion. The end of the world has fascinated me ever since my child's mind could come to an understanding that the world I live in could end. Which is a strange realisation to have as a kid. The nuclear bomb, easily the scariest weapon man has ever made so far. And depending on how we use them, it might just end up being the scariest. The first time I learned of the existence was, funnily enough, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 1, 2007. Thanks Activision for making me have to specify each Modern Warfare game now. It was in the mission Shock and Awe in later Aftermath. That was the time I learned of the nuclear bomb, and it scared me. Seeing the mushroom cloud hanging overhead like a symbol of death carved into the sky, it stuck with me, and the more I learned did not alleviate the heavy sense of dread that hung on the mind of child me. As a molder, I've learned to appreciate as well as fear the bomb. Even the name we give it, the bomb. There have been many bombs we have created as humans, but this one we give the title of the bomb. Like compared to every other bomb, they might as well not be one compared to the atomic bomb. Or its more scarier brother, the hydrogen bomb. A weapon so deadly and destructive it was dubbed by many scientists who worked on the atomic bomb as a weapon of genocide. Due to its size, the only targets big enough for its use are large civilian population centres. Now during the summer of 2023, I saw the movie Oppenheimer about, well, the father of the atomic bomb, and I loved the film from its acting, soundtrack, cinematography and so on. But after watching it, and after the ending, it jump-started my mind on nuclear war again. And that would eventually lead to this video about a game that is very much the nightmare of Oppenheimer and his terrible creation, DEFCON. Ever since I learned the world could end, it's fascinated me. It's such a dark topic that feels very real and possible in this very day. And I like media that looks at the topic and their takes on the post-apocalypse. Many games such as Fallout and Metro look at this in their own and unique ways, and not many of them have you help cause it. DEFCON, Defense Readiness Condition. It's a state of alertness used by the United States Armed Forces that was created in 1959 during the Cold War. It has five levels, all with different activations and readiness of the US Armed Forces. It is not known to the public which level it is on currently, but with declassified documents, we know the levels that it has been in the past. Starting with level 5, the highest and safest, and is just normal state of readiness. DEFCON 4 is above the normal readiness and increased security measures and intelligence watching. DEFCON 3 is increased force readiness above normal, and that the Air Force is ready to mobilize within 15 minutes. This is the lowest the DEFCON level has ever gotten, contrary to popular belief, as only the Air Force has been at DEFCON 2 during the Cuban Missile Crisis not the whole armed forces. DEFCOM 2 is that armed forces must be ready to be deployed and engaged in combat within 6 hours. Its description is, next step to nuclear war. And finally, DEFCOM 1. Nuclear war is about to begin, or has started, and it unlocks the pack a bunch in the Pentagon. Now how does this have anything to do with a game about Oppenheimer's nightmare? Well, that's where we get to the game, DEFCOM. With the tagline, everyone dies. Cheery, very much inspired by the movie War Games and its artistic design, is a game where you play, well, I don't know, a president? A dictator? It doesn't matter whose shoes you take, because they're yours now, and you have to either witness or take part in the destruction of civilization as we know it. The game presents itself like any other grand strategy game, overlooking the world, 
you play as continents, either North America, South America, Europe, Africa. Then you can also play as most of Asia and Russia. You play one of these or multiple of them, it's up to you. Once you start the game, you'll see a red timer at the bottom, counting down to DEFCON 4, since you're currently on the non-hostile DEFCON 5, with each DEFCON level adding a minute to the new timer. In those five minutes, you must set up radar to detect planes and soon missiles, silos that can shoot down air targets or can be switched to send nuclear missiles at the enemy, and last for the buildings, air bases to put down, which has the ability to send fighters or bombers either into enemy territory or to defend yours, with fighters picking off bombers and bombers hitting cities, buildings and ships. Before I move on to the ships, as you place these buildings in your territories, you'll notice all the cities you have, all named and all real cities, and hovering over them, the only information you're given is the population of these cities. Last thing to do on DEFCON 5 is to make your fleets. With battleships that can fight other ships pretty well, aircraft carriers that have fighters and bombers that can help protect the ships from other ships or aircraft or to launch attacks on enemy buildings or cities. And finally submarines, they can stay hidden under the sea and can attack other ships. Or they can surface making them vulnerable to attack but able to launch nukes at targets. Now that you've prepared yourself for the coming war, the clock will soon hit zero and an alarm will alert you that you're now on DEFCOM 4. With a new timer counting down to DEFCOM 3, you can hear the soundtrack becoming a bit more morbid and dreadful with each passing minute, with background sounds like crying and others playing softly, almost like there are people next to you wherever you are, watching you proceed with the end of the world. With DEFCOM 4, you can now detect enemy air units on radar only really giving you extra time to move fleets and planes into position before the clock runs out, leading to DEFCOM 3. With this DEFCOM, war has begun, as naval and air combat begins, with your ships and planes attacking the enemy's planes and ships. Air defences kick in, shooting at any bombers and fighter escorts. The situation becomes hard to manage, as you have a decent number of planes and ships for both you and the enemy to manage. And before you know it, the timer has struck DEFCOM 2. This one doesn't add much, just giving you more time to fight your more conventional war, the soundtrack further pushing the horror and dread of what's about to occur, as the time gets closer and closer to DEFCOM 1. Nuclear combat is authorised, and now bombers can drop nukes, and subs can now surface to launch them as well, and silos that were protecting your cities and buildings from fighters and bombers can now be switched to launching intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. It is a dangerous choice between shooting down or launching ICBMs, but one that can help you destroy the enemy before they destroy you. Soon the first missile will launch, with an alert and big text across your screen saying who fired the first shot. And soon Armageddon breaks loose, with bombers, subs heading to their targets to deliver a nuclear payload, and the skies become colourful as ICBMs leave coloured tracks as they head to their destination. And before you know it, one of yours, or the enemy cities, will be hit, and all you see is a bright glow and text saying the number of dead, only leaving a green aura of radiation behind, and soon that becomes more cities, as the glows become multiple and bigger, witnessing death never before seen at this scale in human history, and you played a part in it. Soon after, the world goes quiet, with all the ICBMs either landing or shot down, same with planes, and if any ships survived, they are left alone in this new world. And now the game comes up with a victory screen, showing how many you killed, lost, and survivors in this new crew world. And that was only one game of DEFCON. By the end, there's a strange sense of hollowness, either in your victory or loss. And speaking of loss, seeing the deaths tallied up so high that the human mind simply can't comprehend. Maybe there is no victor in this game, only who lost the least. It's a rather beautiful and dark and twisted way this game makes you feel. It tastes your emotions in a rather unique way that I can only really say can be understood by playing it. Now for the darker part of this game, I think. It's a way of making you enjoy murdering millions. Now, I take it we've all played games where we can be the bad guy, and most of the time it can be rather funny or fun to choose the evil option a game gives you. But there's something different about how this game makes you enjoy it. In a standard game, eventually the nukes will start flying, and that's when you have to make a choice on the silos. Will they stay the anti-air defence and try to shoot down enemy ICBMs, 
or to switch them over to the nuclear counterpart and start firing back, or maybe fire the first shot before they do. It is a tense and electrifying experience, and from my experience, and of people I know have played the game, the satisfaction of stopping a missile in the air is nothing to seeing one of yours slowly hit its target. And... Sometimes you forget what you've done, or how many people that once lived in that city, and that's horrifying. And when you slowly start to realise that, it can scare you. It makes you wonder if the people at the top, will they have this reaction? Or will they have a more normal one, like you probably had when starting playing the game, of dread and horror? A scenario that sticks out with me is when you keep the silos in air defence and try to protect your people over killing the enemy's people. And there have been two ways I've seen this go. One, you do successfully stop most of the missiles from hitting you, and now the enemy have ran out. A great opportunity to unleash everything you have, to overwhelm them and completely destroy everything that was in their borders. Enemy radar, silos, cities. You protected most of your people, but now you're probably the greatest mass murderer in history. And was it necessary? Or worth it? These questions are ones you could probably debate with for hours and hours, and not reach a unified answer. And the fact this game can make people think like that is darkly special. The second outcome is you fail to stop most of the missiles, and in anger or desperation, you abandon trying to protect your own territory, and you just go scorched earth, launching everything, and hope that with the enemy being too busy shooting at you, he cannot stop you shooting back, basically destroying everything and everyone. A no true winner scenario, and from what I've seen and played, the second option is far more likely than the first, especially when playing with friends. Oh yeah, you can play with friends and end the world together, like in my clip at the beginning of this video, which admittedly can remove a bit of the emotion you'd feel playing the game by yourself, but with friends, it is really another unique and interesting way to play the game. There are different game modes and settings to customise and tweak this horrible scenario you're all in. Just try your best not to let the background menu get you down as it tells you information that'll make it hard to sleep at night. Yeah, even the menu in this game is bleak. How fun. Now, I'd recommend this game to anyone with a little bit of curiosity. It's not that much on Steam, and if you can convince some friends to get the game as well, that's even better. If not, there are people still playing this game on public servers. However, there are some negatives when it comes to the game. It does lack a bit of replayability, with very simplistic gameplay, you could probably play the game yourself for a few hours at most before feeling like you've experienced all that's available. However, the ability to play with friends and different game modes plus customization settings can extend a player's playtime by probably a good few more hours on top of that. Now, I'd recommend playing this game first time by yourself to really, and I mean really, get the horror of this very possible scenario that could take place in our lives and was the thing that Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the bomb, feared dearly. His nightmare, you might say. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please subscribe and leave a like, and share it around, and I encourage you to leave a comment on your thoughts below. And before I go, there is a way of winning the game I haven't said. All you have to do is nothing. Thank you again. See you next time.